Ya te trahio esplain yin is she. Is a slanin a slant, what a cheatney, bashes chin. Hanalani does a che, ah, do, trachini, does a nulle, a hot audi in Ashila. Hi, my name is Trujillo Esplain. I serve as the senior pastor of Red Lake Grace Bible Church in Red Lake, Tonalia, Arizona. My wife's name is Jamie. We have one daughter. Her name is Jazly. And uh, we, we have been pastoring at the church there in Red Lake, Red Lake Grace Bible Church, for about eight years now. And we're just basically responding to the burden um, that God has put on our heart for the people there, our hometown people. And I just want to say thank you uh, for joining um, us here and tuning in. Uh, I want to just also express my gratitude to Ben and Tilly Yazi for just inviting me to share God's word. And it's pretty excited. This is new, you know, different times that we live in. And, and I've never had to preach in front of a camera like this. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to make these adjustments. So just bear with me. Um, and let's do this. Why don't we grab our Bibles and we'll open up to the book of Colossians. And we're going to be studying from Colossians chapter 1 verse uh, 15 all the way to 29. So I titled this um, message, What's on Your Billboard? And I was thinking about how we as people, um, well actually let me back up here. I was thinking about billboards and how they display some type of advertisement. And when you look at it, you know, you know, uh, something a little bit about that. It's like a tool and it allows people to see a little bit more about what is advertised. And sometimes, you know, they're spot on and sometimes they're not spot on. But this reminds me of a time you know, of, of, of our lives, in our lives, where we live and we basically have a kind of billboard that is displayed for, for the whole world to see, basically. And I was thinking even as Christians, you know. Um, that our lives also reflect this billboard illustration because we basically are billboards for Jesus Christ. And the world, they can see this, you know. And, and, and so what I'm saying is that we all have this billboard, uh, whether we like it or not, because it is actually saying something to the world or the people around us. Um, so on Sundays, you know, we have church service and we know uh, what that looks like. Um, what we are at church and who we are at church, but what, what does our lives look like or what are we displaying from Monday all the way to Saturday? So, you know, think, think about this and we're not only live in a physical world, but now we're, we live in a digital world to where we're on camera like this or we're uh, on the social media platforms. And that also, uh, this billboard illustration also applies to those things as well. So what I'm, what I'm also trying to get at here is that our actions as people, and especially as Christians, it speaks louder than words. And that can be a problem if our actions don't match up with our words. So this applies to anybody, of course. Um, but in, for Christians in general, in particular, it can be a problem because we have this great commission that we're supposed to be fulfilling so I want this to be a good challenge for us and for us to think about if our actions match our faith, um, our actions at work, in the community, or with our friends and our family. Uh, now we have the social media life. But these are areas that this display, uh, it actually displays what we really believe. So you are what you believe, basically. Um, so in the book of Colossians, in the first chapter, uh, I was reading and I was seeing the fact that it's the greatest Christological passage in the New Testament. And, and following this first section, the Apostle Paul, he shifts from the person and work of Jesus Christ to his own personal ministry and how it, uh, his life impacts those around him. So we see that the Apostle Paul had great concern uh, for what God was doing in his life and, and also through him. And he, he considered it a great responsibility and how he lived his faith out in the public eye. So Paul knew that and, and the way he lived his life, it actually caused a ripple effect. And, and his lifestyle affected those lives whom God has entrusted to him. So he knew of this billboard illustration, um, basically, because it, it, it impacted those around him. And I want us to keep this, in, this theme in mind because 
uh, when we approach these passages, it'll basically be showing us that we uh, have make a big difference in the world around us, okay? So let us read the passage there found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, all the way to 29, okay? Why don't we turn there? It says uh, here in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body and of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister... Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great Among the Gentiles are the riches of glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. I hope uh, the hope of glory. uh, We him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this, uh, I toil, struggling with all his energy that he will power he that he powerfully works within me. The first point I want to make here is the preeminence of our Lord. And, you know, we are very familiar with our smartphones, right? If you have one, uh, there's icons on there. And, for example, we have the message icon. And the message icon, it represents the message app. So basically, the, the icon, it represents whatever app it's connected to. And I bring up this point because the word icon is found there in verse 15 in the Greek. It is, he is the image. It's there for image. He is the image, the icon of the invisible God. So the Apostle Paul states that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So that would mean that Jesus reveals the very character and nature of of God, and it also would mean that that through Jesus the invisible is made visible. So, um, well, the fact that Jesus He is God incarnate, and He is the icon of our worship. You know, in the book of John, chapter fourteen, verse eight and nine, Philip asks Jesus to show them the Father, and it reads, "Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us." And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And also in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus presents himself uh, as the as the good shepherd. And, And while debating with the Jewish leaders, he makes a bold claim saying, I and the Father are one. So, so Jesus did, did not just claim, did not claim to be a good teacher or a good messenger and a good person, but he actually proclaimed to be equal with God in his essence and in his power and as, as the God man. So the Jews, they, they actually didn't, re, uh, they didn't misunderstand Jesus. And we know this because they picked up stones to stone Jesus after he made this claim of being equal with God. And they considered this claim to be blasphemous. 
In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, it reads, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he holds the universe by the, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, in verse 18, we find preeminence. And, and what preeminence means is the surpassing of all others. It means superiority. It means greatness, supremacy, and excellent. Um, I want to start with the person of Jesus Christ because he is the foundation of our faith as Christians. Uh, verses 15 to 17, we see a picture of creation, the fact that Jesus is the creator and he holds all things together, including you and I. In verse 18, we see church and we see that Jesus is the head of the church. And in verse 19, we see a picture of the cross. We see that peace is only made available through his death and shed blood, uh, his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. So Jesus did not only just die, but he resurrected on the third day. So Jesus, he's a big deal. He's God in the flesh and he is our Savior and our Lord. He is the way. He is the truth. He is, he is the life. So the essential foundation uh, of the message of our faith is the person is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, you know, let us break down the rest of these passages. Uh, the second point I want to make here is uh, the pattern of our lives found in verse 21 to 23. We had a previous life before we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. So there was a past, uh, how we used to live, how we used to think. Uh, what we did, how we spent our money, all these things, you know. Uh, uh, but the passage there says that we had a relation, or we were without Jesus, we were without God, and we were alienated, and we were hostile, and we were evil doers, and we were considered even enemies of God. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of people who have that kind of relationship with God to this very day, whether it is in our own uh, family or friends or our community. Uh, and I, and I often wonder, why don't they come to Jesus? And why didn't I come to Jesus? And of course, it's sin, right? I mean, it's sin is the reason why. And it's the things that we say, think, and do uh, that violates God's standards. But I remember um, reading God's Word as a young person, and, and I, I didn't like it. I, I, did, I refused to read it because what it did, it, it felt like it was, a, it was like a spiritual mirror that went right up in front of me. And I didn't really like what I saw. But uh, God, this is how God saw me and, and it showed me who I was on the inside. And I think that's probably one, one of the main reasons why people don't come to Christ is because of the spiritual mirror. But I believe the Apostle Paul put this in the passage here to remind us as believers where we came from and, and even what it took for us to be a part of God's family. And honestly, when I read this, it leads me to a daily repentance and it should lead us to a daily repentance. Um, so I know there's probably many different viewers out there who have different belief systems, but um, maybe you're out there and you're thinking, you know, but I don't believe in God or I don't believe in the Bible or how in the world does this apply to me? I don't believe in the Christian faith. Uh, um, when I think of these kinds of questions, honestly, especially now during this COVID-19 pandemic, um, I, one thing that comes to my mind is urgency. Is, 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 is even more, more so now because of this pandemic. And I think of life and I think of how precious life is um, and our lives even, you know, uh, uh, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, um, uh, life, life is important still, <laughs> but, but life is precious and, and I find it's very important. And, and guess what? Your, your existence will continue for all eternity yeah, even after you breathe your last breath. So life is important, yes, but spiritual life is far more precious because that lasts for all eternity. And we don't have the luxury of knowing what tomorrow holds or, or, or you know, what the future holds or when we'll breathe our last breath. And death, of course, is one per person and we will all make it. The question I usually ask is not, will, will we die? Oh, but it's actually where will we reside right after we die. And, and 
what did you, what do you believe right about your existence after you die and and are you certain that what you believe is true is it is it reliable are you sure are you certain um but you know speaking of truth unfortunately today truth is no no longer viewed as absolute and it's it's kind of turning into base based on our feelings or our preference or different types of movements we have nowadays but when we treat truth in this way it actually becomes a casualty in society and and the world ends up in chaos and that's what's happening today we can't think that that truth is true because you know it works or it's true because maybe it feels good or maybe it's not even what i believe it's it's my truth some people say right but truth actually is true because it's based on the foundation and the person and the work of jesus christ and and god allows absolute truth through his son jesus christ and to protect us so that we can experience life to its fullest uh the way it's supposed to be experienced so we have to understand that uh truth does not change with the times or the movements uh throughout all these generations um I heard one pastor say it this way he said truth is true even if everyone denies it and and a lie is a lie even if everyone affirms it so truth corresponds to reality uh just like you know 2 plus 2 I use this example a lot but 2 plus 2 equals 4 that's true right and and but if we think that 2 plus 2 equals 89 because maybe it's how we feel there'll be chaos in the mathematics world um and and this is what you know we are doing with truth to this very day unfortunately but we must handle truth carefully and and we can use god as uh, uh the the bible as uh as a reference for truth uh, i believe this truly and holy uh, and because we can test it we can test god's word and you know what it actually holds up in the historical world in the manuscript world in geology in the prophecies that are mentioned here in the old and new testament so i want to encourage you to test what you believe and 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 hold it up Uh, and uh, and compare it and make sure it is based in reality and facts so the bible has been tested over and over and it continues to remain reliable so you can trust god's word so you may wonder okay who is god well god is eternal he he is a creator of all things he is infinite he is powerful he knows past present and future he never changes he is at all places at all times he is faithful good he is righteous he's forgiving he's merciful he's gracious he is self sufficient he is holy he is just and and i i honestly i pray that you consider the words that i'm sharing with you today because it all comes down to your decision that you need to make and God's word it, it tells us that we will be held accountable one day for for his words for truth for absolute truth because we will stand face to face with God when you breathe your last breath so um urgency comes to my mind as a pastor and I really just um want to urge you to come to know Jesus and consider knowing Jesus as your personal savior so uh a few points I want to make of why you should trust in Jesus um Uh point number 1 is your life it it will be safe, you know. Your life will be safe. Jesus saves you from e- eternal separation from him in hell. Uh he took your uh place on the cross and he paid the debt that you cannot pay, I cannot pay to be part of God's family. And and the second thing is that God is with you. He will always be with you. He 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 you will have an alert, an eternal relationship with the one and only true God and you will belong to him. Number 3 as you will know absolute truth. Yeah, you know no more jinn. Uh you will he will have first hand access to the creator of all things. Uh number 4 is you will have peace and forgiveness. You know we we can't find peace in this world today uh but we can only tr- find true peace and that's found in relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh number 5, the your ex, you will experience your true life's purpose. You know, we were all created to to worship God. He 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 wanted genuine love, so he gave us a free will to choose him or deny him. But you can have this peace and you can know him intimately. Uh, you were called to serve him. You were called to worship him. 
uh, and you were called to share Christ with this lost world. Number six, uh, you will have true hope. And when I think of hope, I, I, it doesn't sound too assuring. I remember uh, as a little kid thinking about this, um, but um, people say, I hope I get a job or I hope I win this raffle prize, you know. And, and in cases like that, hope is, is not too certain. Uh, but as Christians, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the one who is certain. And, and, and he is the one who have, we have hope in. He is unchanging. He's the eternal Christ. He knows the past, present, and the future outcome of our lives and all things. So you can rest assured knowing that uh, your eternal life with Christ, when you placed it in Jesus Christ, it is with Christ and it is with God. So and even the fact that he died on the cross for your sins to attain this hope. Um, so verse 22, if you look at the passage there, you're going to see that Paul reminds the Colossae church believers, the members of the church there, that they have a, a present reconciliation uh, because of Jesus's death and resurrection on the cross. And, and you know, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic it has affected many lives in the world and even on the Navajo reservation, you know, we've been praying as a church and a family for physical healing and especially spiritual healing and a revival to happen uh, with the people in our community and this, our circle of influence. But there always has been an urgency and even more so now during these times. Uh, but what I really want to stress is that that we move for Jesus, especially just bringing to mind all the things he's done for us. The Apostle Paul uh, says that we have now reconciled um, his body of flesh by his death in order to present ourselves holy and blameless above reproach before him. And I love the fact that in Romans also, it's commu he communicates while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we have been given so much. And I just really want us to think about these things as believers. And, and even as Christians, you know, I was thinking, uh, I often think that we are a sleeping giant. We just we got to wake up, you know, and we have to start or and continue to live our lives in gratitude for Jesus. And, and even just based on the fact that Jesus reconciled um, us to him and we are also presented holy and blameless. And that, that's a big deal when it comes to our soul, our eternal life with God. So our job as believers is, is to share the fact that there is hope, not in this world, but uh, hope found in Jesus Christ. So um, we need to share this eternal security with those that God brings around us. Because this world, we will experience um, trials and tribulations. That's not going to change. Uh, but we need to share the gospel truth uh, safely and with all the resources that we have been given in this very day. And there's three things here. Uh, we need to, to live our lives in gratitude to God. And we, we, we also need to know that we didn't initiate this relationship we have with God. And lastly, is being in the family of God, it, it's actually a privilege, you know. It, it's a privilege we have to have this relationship with God. So uh, the question comes to mind is, how are we showing this gratitude? Um, and, and what does our Christian billboard look like? Or, or what are we advertising? And how are we representing the one who saved us? Uh, are we living our lives uh, with an urgency for people to know Jesus? Um, and and I, I honestly, I praise God if you are active in serving the Lord and you're giving your life and putting the effort to reach people for Christ. And I praise God for you, uh, but we need more. We need more believers to just kind of stand up, you know, and, and serve the Lord. We may feel that we probably can't do much in this COVID-19 pandemic, you know, to stay at home. You got to stay indoors and things like that. But, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we need to make use of this quarantine time that we have. Just being home, uh, we need to utilize the resources that we have. Uh, honestly, when I think about this um, catas uh, the catastrophe we're involved in right now with the COVID-19, uh, through a biblical deduction, we get to see what God describes as catastrophic event. In the book of Exodus, verse uh, chapter 9, verse 15 to 16, when we turn there, it reads that... Um, uh, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, which I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out from among them. So it's actually, you know what, it's, it's an invitation and not just a punishment 
but an invitation. But it's also for us believers not to remain silent, but to display this billboard for Jesus during these times. It's just a sense this, uh, to know that there's a sense of urgency, even more so now during this pandemic. Um, and the question is, okay, how, how, do I, how do I put this into practice? How do I do this? I, I broke this down to four Ps. The first P is pray. Of course, is, is to talk to God and to share and pray for opportunities for people to come to Christ, for a revival, for a healing, for spiritual growth and other believers. The second thing is proclaim. Uh, when, when God opens that door to witness, we need to be studying and ready to give an answer for the faith that we have living within us. The third thing is participate, uh, of course, safely during these times to give to the needy, to help your masana and the elderlies and to put your time in to, uh, to contribute your time into helping this world that's in need at this moment. Uh, the last thing I put for the P is phone, right? We all have phones, some, some of us do, but we need to be utilizing this phone, this technology. Call, text, join, uh, join a teleconference church service and pray with people over the phone. Talk to them, witness. And some, of, some people have this social media platform and just use that for the Lord. Um, last point I want to make here from our passages is found from verses 25 to 29. Uh, I titled it The Proclamation of Our Lips. And, and this come, uh, uh, comes very um, uh, personal here as believers uh, because we've been given the responsibility and the privilege in sharing the gospel message to those people that are around us. And the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's re it is required of the stewards that they be found faithful. You know, we, we are to be faithfully managing this truth that, and the hope of Jesus Christ that has been given to us. So, you know, in the passages that we read, there's, there's a mystery in verse 26. And this mystery that Paul talks about is the fact that um, the, 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 um, the gospel truth, it was once concealed and, and now it's revealed. And, and even more so now, the Apostle Paul talks about this mystery uh, to explain that there are Gentiles that would uh, now that are given this um, um, privilege to become part of God's family. And even us, as you know, as Navajos, we've been given this privilege to be a part of God's family. And, and the next thing here is in verse uh, 26 as well, there is a mission, you know. There is a labor that Apostle Paul says that is given to all of God's children. And that's where I was thinking about this urgency, is this labor. It should be carried out with all of our might. Um, and this urgency of this COVID-19 pandemic that's taking place now, uh, I think about this word labor, which in, in the Greek, it means to work to the point of exhaustion, uh, striving for the strength of the Lord. You know, and I pray, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are found working for the Lord and we are serving with our whole heart, might, and our being. The Apostle Paul, he was locked up in prison, uh, in the prison cell in Rome. But being locked up, he did not stop his laboring for Jesus. You know, the cell bars, it didn't hold him back, uh, hold back the work of the Lord, but this labor continued and it should be continued by God's children. And this COVID-19 pandemic, it should not uh, hold us back or silence us as Christians, um, but it, we should be using this opportunity to share the work of the Lord and continue the work of the Lord. And, and may God find you uh, serving during this time. Let us take some time to pray. Father, we just are grateful that we heard words of truth from you, dear Lord. And I just um, am grateful that we can know absolute truth. I pray right now for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, I ask that um, the words that we have learned from you, that it would have been an encouragement to us and that it would have just um, gave us a boost that we need to continue to serve during this difficult time. And Lord, and also that it may have been a conviction to us because Lord, your words, uh, they're living and they're powerful and they can convict us 
uh, Lord, and I pray that it has done so in those who may may have just needed that extra uh, boost to serve and work, Father God. Forgive us in our times of failure when we just have just been in a, in a phase of relaxation during this uh, very urgent time that we should be spreading and living this gospel truth in our lives, Father God. I pray for those who don't know Jesus and they're just listening to this for the first time and they're finding out about who you are, O oh God. And I ask that you would just speak to them, Father God, and be with them from this day forward. And I pray that your words of truth would resonate in their minds and hearts and God surround them with people that would only point them to Jesus, Father. And I pray that they would make a decision to follow you one day, God. And I pray for those who are just don't know about this whole thing, Lord. And I pray that you would just continue to speak truth in term, to their minds and hearts as well, Father God, and allow them to come to Jesus. Would you just draw them to yourselves, Father? Thank you again for time in your word and time that we can come together, Lord, and just worship you uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I just want to say thank you for joining us, and I pray and hope that um, you would have a blessed evening and a blessed night. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wheatfields 2020, Saturday night service, August the 1st. My name is Dennis Bernal. I pastor Kintlana Church of the Nazarene in Flagstaff, Arizona. And some of you might know that we're building a nice building over there. We're still not finished, but we're almost there. So, Come and see us when you get a chance. I would like to read from the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, uh, written by Dr. Luke, they tell us. And, and so uh, the same person that wrote the Gospel of Luke. And so I want to uh, read verse 1 to 9 in Luke chapter, or Acts chapter 9, I mean. And... Uh, the title of my message will be Answering to God. And so here's how it reads in the ninth chapter, verse 1 to 9, Acts. Then Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, uh, so that a, if he found any of who were of the way, whether man or woman, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. I, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And he met the man he journeyed with him, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into, Ma into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And that's how it reads in uh, verse 1 to 9 in Acts chapter 9. Answering to God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I ask you tonight to be with all of us. I pray that you will bless your word. And may your Holy Spirit minister to each and every one of us. And Lord Jesus, when um, some may come to you tonight, uh, giving their lives to you, others may return to you, uh, Lord Jesus. But I just pray that you would encourage every minister, every worker for your kingdom. And Lord Jesus, strengthen them, I pray, in the Holy Spirit. We ask your Spirit to minister to us, and we plead the precious blood of of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Four things I want to share with you tonight. First of all, um, in our answering to God, uh, there's a confrontation that the Lord Jesus has with us, as he did with Saul. And then secondly, there's communication from the Savior and we back to him. So there is communication. Thirdly, Saul was given a commission, and we also are given a commission. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is the completion of the call that God has on our lives. And we all want to finish, like they say, with a bang. And so some of you might be have uh, slowed down or you feel like this is too much, I can't handle it. But tonight I want to encourage you to get up and go again, especially to those of us that are ministers. First of all, uh, Saul was confronted by the Savior on the road to Damascus on that night. And as he was journeying uh, on a horse, possibly, and uh, light shone from heaven, and he fell to the ground, and, and he saw a light that was so bright uh, as a uh, uh, John, in the book of Revelation, said, I fell to the ground as dead. That might have been his experience. And sometimes that's our experience too. Because when we are confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, one of the first things that he wants us to do is he wants us to fear him. So that's the first order of business for you and I. But in the confrontation with the Savior, um, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And so that was that sometimes in, in our lives, uh, the Savior saying, why are you uh, against me? Now back in those days when they used an oxen to plow or to grind the corn, uh, because cows kick sideways. Uh, my uncle told me that horses always kick backwards and uh, people kick forward but the cow always kicks sideways, the cattle kick sideways and so that was the truth and so they would make a sharpened uh, wooden thing or metal and put it on the side where the cow, when oxen kick sideways they would kick that and they would learn not to kick sideways and so Jesus when he confronts us he wants us to obey him he doesn't want to kick against him and rebel or go against what he, he has called us to do. So one of the first things that I would encourage you is when you are confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ, don't kick. And uh, because when you do that, you're only hurting yourself and you're only going against God's will. 
So get in line with what God has for you because when Jesus confronts us, uh, it's one of the most fearful things. Uh, the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So always be reminded that uh, when we are confronted by Jesus, we are to learn to fear him. And in the scripture, all of scripture, uh, every man and woman that God ever called and used, they learned to fear him. Moses uh, cried out, I exceedingly quake and tremble. So learn to be afraid of God. When Noah uh, was told by God that uh, rain was coming and there would be a flood, the Bible says Noah moved with fear. So learn uh, when you are confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ that Jesus means business. He doesn't fool around. And one of the most important things in life for you and I is when we are confronted on that road that we are traveling. I myself was many years ago traveling on a different road and um, I was confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ. And his word to me was, Dennis, will you follow me? You're going against my will. You have a religion that has no power and can't overcome the problems that you are facing. And so I came to the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the road that I was traveling on, I stopped and turned around and went the other way, following the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the word repent means, is to stop, turn around, and go the other way. So when you are confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ, get up, stop, and go the other way. Go back towards it on that narrow road. Not the broad way the Bible says that leads to destruction, but go on the narrow road that leads to life. Get back in line. Don't kick against what Jesus is telling you to do. And so that was a confrontation that Saul had with the Lord Jesus Christ and that you and I have. It could be that during this time of uh, the pandemic and all these things, uh, some of you might have been laid off from work and some of you are spending more time at home than you ever spent it in, in your life. Well, I learned what to do. I'm reading more from the Bible. I spend more time with my family and I'm enjoying it. And I'm thinking this must be what it's like to be retired, not having to work and staying home and reading the Bible a lot more and spending more time in prayer. And being with my grandkids when they stop by and see me. And so stop and turn around and go the other way. It's very important for us in life to do that in our Christian world. And then secondly, Jesus began to communicate uh, with Saul. Saul, Saul, um, he, he cried out to him. Did you know that Jesus will all, always call us by name? And so Paul's answer back was, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It could have been that, um, reading between the lines, Jesus might have said to him somewhere along the way, I want our conversations to be different from here on out. Instead of you working against me, and we'll get to that in a little bit, uh, we will work together. And I will show you things to do. And in scripture, Jesus said about those that are called believers or Christians. And, and here in our scripture, uh, the ones that were called the way. That were the way. And so Jesus said about them, My sheep know my voice, and I know their voice. And so when communication began to take place, Saul began to learn to recognize the voice of his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, in my early Christian life, I began to learn to recognize uh, the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and especially when communication began to take place and Saul uh, knew scripture. He calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. He calls himself one that knew the law more than any other per person, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Now, scripture was no problem to him, but understanding scripture and learning to communicate with the Lord Jesus Christ was a problem for him. So when he began to understand that Jesus died for him and rose again and went back to heaven, was now talking to him from heaven, and one day was going to come again, his communication with Jesus changed. It became a back and forth, um, knowing one another's voice. I like to tell a story about uh, my dad, Suzette. Uh, when I was going to Kim's Canyon boarding school way back in the uh, early 60s, one day they, they told me, I, you have a phone call. And so I ran to the telephone back in the old days when all the telephones were black and they had cords about five feet long and they were all coiled up. And, and he, so you had to uh, have the cord attached to the phone and the receiver in order to talk on the telephone. So I got the phone and I said, hello. And somebody on the other line said, Ya teshi ya tishishte tadishnente. Hello, my son, this is me. Is this you? And I could recognize my dad's uh, uh, voice just by the way he talked and, and how he expressed himself and all that. I knew that this was my dad talking and he knew it was his son, Dennis, talking to him. So we communicated and I was so happy for that phone call. And to this day, I still remember that phone call that he placed uh, to me uh, when I was going to Kings Canyon boarding school. I recognized his voice and he recognized my voice. Did you know that the more you pray, the more you read the Bible, the more you begin to recognize the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and the more he will know your voice when you pray. In fact, the Bible says that when we talk about Jesus, he'll talk about us in heaven. In other words, we'll be famous in heaven when we live for him and pray to him. So that communication, when I talk to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's when I pray. And when he talks to me is when I read my Bible. So I tell the people that I pastor and uh, every chance that I get, we as Christians, let's read five to 10 chapters of the Bible every day. I just finished the whole New Testament and started from the Old Testament again. I want to read through the Bible again. I want to do it two times this year because I like it when God talks to me and I learn to recognize his voice. The more he talks to me, the more I know his voice. And the more I pray, the more he recognizes my voice. The same is true for each and every one of us as we learn to communicate with heaven itself. In fact, the book of Revelation says that uh, uh, there was smoke going up to the, you know, the holy place in heaven. And John wrote, this is the prayers of the saints. So your prayer reaches heaven itself. Sometimes you might feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling. It's not. It's going right through the ceiling, straight up into space and right straight into heaven itself the God's very throne. That's where your prayers go when you communicate with your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was communication. It could be that some of you have stopped reading your Bible. Some of you ministers might, well, I don't have to preach this Sunday, so I just won't read my Bible. I won't study. And some of you Christians out there might be saying, well, why pray when all these bad things are happening? 
In fact, the Bible says that um, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. You know, when God is with us during troublesome times, that he will always be there. Right before Jesus went back to heaven in Matthew, the 28th chapter, Jesus said, um, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, even unto the end of the world. These are the last days. We're nearing the end of the world, I believe. Even until then, he says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. Did he say, well, during uh, the pandemic in 2019 and 20, I'm going to leave you? No. He says, even unto the end of the world, I will never leave you. I will be with you. I will not forsake you. So Jesus is with you even during these times. So communicate, talk to him, and lean on him. Learn, learn to pray for an hour. Many years ago, as uh, a Christian asked me, how long should I pray? Well, I said 10 hours, and I was reading my Bible, and the Bible says when they, Jesus was praying in the garden at Gethsemane, he asked his disciples, could you not watch with me uh, an hour? And I thought, well, should I pray an hour? Well, I give it a try, and I started praying in only 10 minutes. And said, Lord, teach me how to pray. Well, the Lord says, pray for all the people that you know in your church that live on the east side of your house. And then go uh, to the south side, uh, everyone that lives south, and go to the west, and go to the north. Pray for all those people. Then pray for all the ministers that you know. Then pray for all the prayer requests from this week and last week and that you remember and pray for people that need salvation. And then pray for yourself, all the needs that you have, food, clothing, and shelter, gas, ticket to put in a pickup truck and money to pay the bills. Because you promised to supply all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And you're building a church, so pray that I will help you to build your church. Lo and behold, I got up exactly one hour. Learned to pray at the midnight. Jesus told a story about a friend that came at midnight. Oh, I'm, I'm too busy, I'm tired, my children are with me, and I can't go down and give you uh, to eat to what you need. And the Bible says his friend kept on her knocking during the night. The Bible says not because he was his friend he gave him, but because of his importunity. Importunity means just to keep doing it. You know, sometimes when we're communicating, trying to communicate with our Savior, it looks like uh, uh, we're not getting through. Keep praying. I know a mom that prayed for her son for over 30 years finally became a Christian, her son. Her son to this day is still a Christian, one of the churches. She's gone to heaven, but keep praying. Keep knocking on the door. Don't give up in your communication with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then another thing that happened to Saul on this Damascus road was he got a commission. And Jesus told him, go to a man by the name of Ananias, and he will, it will be told thee what thou must do. The part I didn't read in verse uh, 6. Uh, actually, I read that, I guess. And, and so, uh, it'll be told you what you must do. And I've talked to Ananias, and he knows all about you, and he knows you were once his enemy, and he's scared of you, but I talked to him. I fix everything for you. Did you know that when God calls us and commissions us, those of you in the church, He'll always have the right people in place for us. He'll always have the right people to encourage you and the people that will do you the most good. He'll surround you with good people that can help you on your Christian journey. And ministers, if you're discouraged, He'll send someone to encourage you and say, keep on going, brother. You can do it. And not only that, but um, Jesus told him, uh, now, now you're going to go to uh, a street called Straight. Jesus will always give you the address. 
and his commission. He'll always point you to the right church ministers that you are the pastor. And some of you Christians during this pandemic time, well, I'm gonna leave my pastor over here because this and that and that and this and this and that. You've been complaining about your church and about your pastor. Well, let me tell you, if the Lord gave you an address, go to that address. Don't start changing your address until God says it's time to go. You stay there, you stay put until God leads you otherwise. Now I pastored five churches and I've stayed until a burden was lifted from me. Because one day a pastor told him, I'm gonna stay until the burden's gone. And so I practiced the same thing in my pastoral career. I will stay until the Lord says, I got a new address for you. You, you go to a place called Stray Street. And so it is for each and every one of us, because not only will God have the right people in place for you, but also the right address, the right place for you. So don't give up on your pastor. Don't give up on your church. Hang tough. Be faithful. Not only to Jesus, but to your pastor and to your church. I tell you a story about Paul after he became an apostle and he's going to prison. And Jesus told you, you must uh, uh, go to Rome. Uh, Paul himself said, I must see Rome. Well, the Lord had a different idea of how to send Paul to Rome. He sent him as a prisoner. The Roman government paid for his ticket. And he's on his way to, and, and, and as they're loading the boat, the ship, uh, Paul said, I perceive that uh, there'll be much harm. And the professional sailor said, well, Paul, you're a preacher. We're sailors. We know the sea and we know all the winds and the trade routes and everything. And the Bible says with commodious too, that it was, it was fair. In other words, sailing was right. Paul, you stick to your preaching and we'll show you how to sail the sea. So they got on the boat and lo and behold, Paul was right. The Bible says the storm came so fierce that all hope of them being alive was taken away. They began to throw the cargo overboard. They even tied the boat in two. Finally, Paul says, um, the Lord stood by me and said, we're all going to make it. But you should have listened to me. And there's times in our lives that sometimes the preacher has to say to us, you should have listened to your minister. And I'm saying to you tonight, there in this COVID-19, when we're all going through this pandemic, we should have listened to all the preachers that were talking to us all these years. We should have. But now, stick with your minister, stick with your church, and you will make it. You know why? Because the Bible says that as they were uh, sailing on that boat and the ship and, and it was getting dangerous and some of the sailors and you know, they said, well, if we jump off the boat, we'll, we'll be okay. I don't know about hanging with this preacher guy. And Paul says, um, cut the boats away. Only if you stay in the boat will you make it. So I'm saying to you tonight, let's stick with the preacher. Let's stick with the pastor. And when we do that, we will make it. Listen to your national leaders, the spiritual leaders, the faithful ministers of the gospel. And if we do that, we will make it. Make a long story short, the Bible says they all safely made it and they wintered there on the island. So it is, we're on a journey. 
we're going our own journey, but now we're on a journey with the Lord. And if we will learn to stick with the church and stick with our pastor and our commission, we're going to make it. We are going to make it. Let me reassure you, stick with the church, with your church, and with your pastor, the address that God gave to you. Not the address that you want, but the address that God gives to you. That is your commission as a Sunday school teacher, as a, a church board member, one of the leaders in your local church. Stick with that church. It might look like it's sinking, but if you stick with the pastor, you're all going to make it in your church. And the Bible says, not only was there a confrontation, but a communication, a commission, but also Jesus said, Saul, I want you to complete your call. In other words, stick to it till the end. He that endures to the end shall be saved. There's something about endurance. <clears throat> I was watching some kids, one of my grandsons, uh, working out, and and uh, he's struggling, and he's going, but he, he's made it all the way through his workout with his older brother. Now, older brothers can be tough. We all know that. But I saw little brother, and uh, he just kept on going. He endured to the end. The Bible says that uh, you have need of patience after that you have done the will of God to receive the promise. Because there's something at the end of our journey waiting for us. Paul says, I've run, um, I've finished my course, I've run a good race. Now there are ways for me down there. He says, there's a reward, there's a crown waiting for me. And so it is unto a believer by the name of Archippus. He, he wrote, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry that thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. So I'm saying to you out there, finish your ministry. Whatever church that you're called to, complete all the years, the months, and the weeks, and the hours that God has given to you. Finish the course. Run a good race. And if you do that, there's a reward waiting for you. I was doing a message on uh, some of the things about heaven a few weeks ago at our local church. And I, I read about the streets of gold and the city of gold that will be in heaven. And I thought, how much uh, worth, at least according to our economy today, the valley of gold, I wonder how much heaven's streets are worth. You know, it got to be, the numbers were so huge that I, my mind couldn't comprehend. So I said, well, let's try a, a driveway. They tell me driveway is about 18 by 32. You in construction know better than I do. The average uh, driveway, if we paved it with pure gold, in that small area, it will be worth 18 billion plus 18 and a half billion dollars just for a small driveway and heaven we're going to walk on that and there's going to be miles and miles and miles of streets of gold imagine what your reward will be if your walking place is gold how much more valuable and worth and wonderful will our rewards be? And so tonight, some of you might be, well, I don't know about this Christianity thing. I still enjoy my old religion. And, and I'll tell you, there's fear in the old religion. I remember I was so afraid of death when I was a kid. Yee, ya, ye ya. But I overcame that fear through the Lord Jesus Christ and His death 
and resurrection. It could be that some of you are undecided and Christianity is okay and I like I like all religions. But to personally know the Savior, to talk to him every day, is one of the best privileges in life that you can ever have. I've talked to some famous people in my life. I remember in the late 60s, I met uh, Robert F. Kennedy before he was shot to death. And I shook his hand, said hello to him, he said hello to me. And I remember <coughs> shaking Chuck Swindoll's hand at his church back when he was pastor in Fullerton, California. But the greatest, the greatest privilege in life is for me to get up every morning and say, good morning, Lord Jesus. Or when I go to say, good night. Good night. Savior, talking to the creator of the universe, the first and the last, the first begotten of the dead, the greatest privilege in life. So three things I want to close with tonight that, uh, that we can do. Remember, there's a confrontation, there's communication, there's a commission that we get, and Jesus wants us to complete what we're doing. Don't give up. I remember when I was a, a young minister, and and I was, oh, it's just too hard to be a minister. I get complaints and criticized all the time. I might as well just give up. So I went to work and turned on a Christian radio. There's a song playing. The song simply said, don't give up on the brink of a miracle. So I want to say to you tonight that there could be a miracle waiting for you. Just a few more steps. Remember the story of Lot and his wife? Lot, uh, get out of here. Go up. Don't look back and you will make it. Sodom, Gomorrah, fire and brimstone is going to rain down and God's going to destroy the city. So a lot made it, but his wife, maybe one final step that she needed to go over that hill and lose sight of her past. The past would be gone and everything would be new. She looked back. The Bible says she became a pillar of salt. Don't look back. It might be that you just need to go one more week before your miracle. You might have got to go one more month, one more year. Something good is going to happen to our churches. God guarantees it. Three things. Today, if you hear his voice, if Jesus is talking to you, answer. Don't put it off. Tomorrow, keep on working for the Lord. Keep on serving him. Keep on praying. Keep on reading your Bible. Keep on doing what you've been doing. Don't give up. Don't turn back. Go all out. For Jesus and ministers keep studying keep preparing your messages you don't know when your opportunity might come be ready in season out of season the Bible tells us and so be always ready to give an answer and then finally as I mentioned before the rewards are coming. 
the rewards are coming. Now, some of them we get in this life. And I love it when God blesses me in this life. Many years ago, I, I needed some money. And, and uh, I said, uh, I told my son, when we lost our son in a lot, about 11 months ago. But I told him, uh, I need a check in the mail, so I'm praying for a check in the mail. And he's kind of skeptical, you know how young people are. And I walked out to the mailbox and I opened my mailbox and there's a letter. I check in the mail for a few thousand dollars. <laughs> and uh, apparently there had been a mix up and that I was supposed to have gotten the money and accumulated over a period of time. And the bank finally sent me the money. Uh, a good amount, what I needed. And one day, uh, I was coming home again. I, I told my son, remember that time I got a check in the mail? Well, I'm praying for a check in the mail. This time, yeah, dad's praying for a check in the mail. It'll probably come. So I jumped off at the mailbox, got the mail and opened the mailbox. There's a check in the mail. Seven to six cents. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord reminded me, you didn't ask for how much. <laughs> I said, thank you anyway, Lord. I just wanted my son to know that you are a God that answers prayer. That you do listen to me. And God will listen to you. Sometimes he'll bring the reward soon. But most of them are, the Bible says, when we get to heaven. There'll be a crown waiting for us. Look, Revelation talks about the seven rewards for the overcomers. Be an overcomer. Make up your mind. I want to be an overcomer. Give your heart and life to Jesus if you don't already know him. Some of us that are servants of the Lord, don't give up. Keep studying the Bible. Get those messages ready. Uh, this past week, I was looking through some of the messages. I found a pile of messages, some from 2010, 2011, a stack of them. On my iPad, I carry 30 or 40 messages that I prepared. Another iPad that I broke, there's over 150 messages that I've done just in case I need it. So ministers, just in case, get some messages ready. Don't give up. Our Father and our God, thank you so much for this time together. Bless the wheat fields, the leaders, Ben and Tilly, and all the other leaders. Uh, that you brought together. I pray that you would use all the ministers, the musicians, and the workers you know, for Wheatfields uh, this year. We can't meet on the campground personally, but Lord, through the internet and other means, by recordings, your word, your message goes on. Encourage every heart, challenge every minister, challenge every Christian as you confront them, communicate with them, and they with you. Give us a commission. And Lord, put it in our hearts to complete what you've called us to do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.